Welcome to Why Is This Good, a podcast by the Naples Writers Workshop. I'm Christine, and I'm here with John. Hey, John. Hello. Okay, it's my turn. I chose a story by Kristen Arnett, which you may or may not recall. Also wrote another story that we read forever ago called Gator Butchering for Beginners. And this is similar. It's called How to Eat Chicken Wings. And it's uh, even set up the same way, but it's flash fiction. And I'm going to read the second section here. Step two, X and Y axis. When you go to dinner with your parents on your first weekend home from college, let them know you've given up chicken wings. Your father will immediately drive the whole family to an all-you-can-eat barbecue restaurant, straddle a bench at a long wooden table while sauce is ladled over slabs of pork and beef and crinkle-cut fries, eat a dry-baked potato while your father points a wing at your face and says, no daughter of mine. Let your mother squeeze your arm and whisper that you'd probably like chicken wings if you gave them half a chance. Wouldn't your life be easier if you ate chicken wings? Your mother says she doesn't particularly like them either, but chicken wings have afforded her a stable lifestyle. How can you have children without chicken wings? Your father will pile some on your plate despite your protests, orange grease mingling with the mayonnaise from your coleslaw. Best case scenario, your mother will eat the wings while your father's in the bathroom. Worst case scenario, you'll feel guilty enough to keep eating chicken wings for the next three years. This is such a great story. I know. I think chicken wings are a metaphor. I don't know. So the last story, and I talked about the frog, and I was like, you can read it literally. You don't have to think about it as a yes. metaphor. In Town of Birds, you can read that literally. You don't have yes. to think about it as a metaphor. And then this one, I'm like trying to just like forget that and read it literally. But it's like, what is the metaphor? <laughs> I <laughs> yeah. don't know why. Me, who hates figuring out meanings and metaphors, just couldn't get that out of my head. Like, what? what is the metaphor here? <laughs> yeah. Well, I think uh, maybe we are kind of primed for how to understand this story because of what we know of the last story. And yeah, I believe the takeaway, or we at least discussed this for her last story because it was a similar length and it was broken up this way with steps. And the whole time she's talking about how to actually physically butcher a gator, but then like immediately after telling you like how to slide the knife in wherever, she's also inserting all of this how-to information and it's basically about like getting over an ex and yeah. butchering like like the ghost of that relationship, whatever it is. And so it's immediately a metaphor throughout, but it's also not this like veiled metaphor at all. She's literally talking about her girlfriend. And then the next step will be like, okay, so uh, back to the gator, right, right, right. But it was really well done. And I think one of the things we talked about was, oh, wouldn't it be cool to just do like a how-to article? Like we talked about how it was basically written like an instruction guide. And I like that she just like is plagiarizing herself essentially with this format. She's like, you know what? I'm really good at it. And she like did it again. And I was like, hell yeah, because she is really good at it. And it's brief. And each of these little sections, I think there's how many? Three steps are basically vignettes about chicken wings. The first one is one of these times that she's eating them as a kid and she gets like the barbecue sauce everywhere. And people like think that she's on her period because it's like on her underwear and all this weird shit. And it's like vivid. And it's it's so specific and weird that it's like, I imagine this happened, if not to Kristen Arnett, then like someone she knows, right? (laughs) And then this this second one is, you know, she's uh, with her parents but she's back from college and she's telling them she doesn't like chicken wings but I don't think she's really telling them in this moment that she's like vegetarian or whatever I think she's like telling them like I like girls and they're like well how well how can you uh have a family if you you won't eat the chicken wings you know that's the moment when it's most specifically like (laughs) yeah he says your mother says she doesn't particularly like them either but chicken wings have afforded her a stable lifestyle how can you have children without chicken wings yes I'm like that is the only time not maybe not the only time there's other moments but it felt it's like the most the obscure most, yeah yeah the most direct kind of yeah. uh attachment to something you're like you can definitely have kids with that oh <laughs> <laughs> And then this final section is eating chicken wings at a party and she sees like a kid choke on one of them. And so she fishes it out of his mouth and, you know, saves the day. And then later she's eating chicken wings with this girl and they finally make out and there's like barbecue sauce everywhere. Like what a cute little uh, arc, right? There's an arc to this story versus like the gator butchering for beginners. I'd have to go back and see if there was an arc. I feel like that one was pretty even keel in terms of, you know, the story being like, this is how you 
end the thing. This is how you end it. This is how you end it. This is how you end it. And with this, it's like, you love chicken wings, but they like embarrassed you. And then it's like, you don't like chicken wings and everyone's giving you shit for it. And then it's like, you somehow are eating them again, but now it's okay because you've like returned to this disgusting meal, like of your own accord and you're getting what you want now. And like, you know, having your sexual awakening. That kiss is slathered in barbecue sauce. Yeah. Just like that first experience. It's just a big mess. You're like, eh, it's accept the mess. Yeah. Like I'm trying to think of the literal kind of like kissing someone with barbecue sauce all over. And I'm like, Ugh. <laughs> yeah, it sounds disgusting. But yeah, it says when you finally kiss mouth sliding together, covered in barbecue sauce, you'll fall in love with chicken wings all over again. But that's like, it's kind of like referencing the first one where it's yeah. like the mess is like part of it and enjoy it for what it is, you know? Yeah. So this is like, it's so brief, but everything is so specific. And I would not encourage someone to actually fictionalize a story like this. I would try to think to yourself, is there something like chicken wings that you can think to yourself have had, have appeared in your life repeatedly, right? Like where maybe you've had very different encounters with them. I think food is like a really good hunting ground for this kind of story too, because food is like one of the few things that we eat over and over again. And and it has different meanings or you remember it differently or you remember it vividly. Like you can think about like birthday cake, you know, you have it every year. Maybe you have the same one every year. Maybe every birthday is like horrific in its own way. This made me think of your friend's story. Now I make my own bread. Yes. Because it's that kind of thing. It's like just the recurring the food, cooking food. Yeah. There's not a ton of things like food where you eat it all day, every day. And you, we have like such strong like associations with it. It's like at once commonplace and like rich for this kind of look. But yeah. So I don't know. I, I mean, like to kind of jump ahead, like that would be my takeaway is to think about maybe a food specifically or something else in your life, maybe a place and you've visited it a handful of times, but each time it feels kind of different. I think if we all like sat quietly for a moment, we could think of something like this, you know? And then of course, to make it a true Kristen Arnett ripoff, you would insert something here where like along these touches with this familiar thing, what's changing is not just like your encounter with it, but you know, something larger. It's kind of like a metaphor, but it's more just kind of like, this is how my life evolved. And I can tell you how it evolved through three vignettes around chicken wings. She could also tell you this story, not in vignettes, or she could tell it in vignettes that have nothing to do with chicken wings, you know, but there's something really unique about including something that, you know, unless you've had to come out of the closet, maybe you're familiar with, like I eat chicken wings, but I'm straight, you know, and I can read the story and kind of identify with parts of it or like come at it that way. It's it's how you like kind of shoehorn and maybe a different message or whatever. Yeah. And anytime, especially with metaphor, you take like two seemingly unrelated things and that's where, you know, poetry and things happen. Well, this is the interesting thing about this is how the metaphor shifts, right? Because it's the, she picked three vignettes and the chicken wings don't quite mean the same thing in each of them. Yeah. And they kind of shift even within, if you want to think about it as having a meaning, but like it, you can think of it having like a, a, a corresponding meaning, like chicken wings equals X or Y. Or you can think of it just being her emotional connection with chicken wings in each moment. In the second one, she's rejecting the chicken <laughs> wings and her parents are like trying to like, you know, her father's waving a chicken wing in her face. And then in the third one, she's accepting them again. She has to literally save someone from choking at one. So the the relationship between the um kind of the uh, central object, um, I don't want to call it a metaphor, but the object of yeah. the totem of the story, the connection between her the symbol. and the, Thing. Yeah, but the symbol is it changes, so it's not quite yeah. a symbol. Mm-hmm. You're right. <laughs> anyway, so that can, like the way the emotional connection between the, the elements uh, shifts and changes maps the arc. Right. Yeah. It's just such an interesting way to, to do it. I think that's why when I was reading it, I was having that reaction of what is the metaphor because it was changing. Right. But the change is the point. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, like I said, I'd have to read the the other one that we did by her to see if there was a similar arc. That one was a weaving. I was like, she was describing one thing and describing another thing. It was like instructions. Thing. Yeah, not vignettes. This is also built on that same form that like uh, we first did with Lori Moore, How to Become a Writer. Yeah. She called it the mock, imper- second person mock imperative, something like that. So this is literally that again. Same as Gator Butchering for Beginners because uh, right. that was like instruction manual, right? Yes. How to, how 
how to do this, how to do that. This is literally, again, how to eat chicken wings, right? Right. But I think in this one, there's a, it's an interesting slipperiness, even with the form. She has that imperative address, you know, you should do this. And even the imperative words like, uh, pay attention. You'll be the only one who notices when he chokes. Lie him down on the ground, surrounded by dirty napkins, etc. Root in his wet red mouth with a single digit. But then it, it kind of slips into not imperative, but indicative, where it's just uh, kind of stating things like, uh, uh, that whole section begins a friend of a friend will meet you this is in the future tense even will meet you in this new year's party overhead the fireworks will pop and spray like champagne like that's not that imperative mood that's just indicative you know like just telling us what's happening or will yeah. happen there is a, a an interesting slipperiness between kind of ordinary scene setting and then the imperative this is what you should do the how-to part of it and it just kind of moves between those to uh, create these scenes i think we talked about this in the original Lori Moore one, or if we didn't, we should have, how it's written as if it's instructions, but what it's really doing is creating scenes, right? right. And it's creating a character. It's not literally us. It's creating a character who would follow these things, to whom the things that happen in those scenes happened. And the imperative part is just what that character would have done in those scenes. So you create, you know, the traditional way of creating a scenes is in the indicative, you know, this is what happened, blah, blah, blah. So that mixture makes a lot of sense and it helps you build a scene but it also keeps that how-to form i don't know yeah. i was just noticing that slipperiness i thought it was um it felt like it was drifting away from the form in places yeah i would be interested to see what the effect would be if these were just written out as scenes like without the how-to thing you know you can even do it like just a roman numeral and then a paragraph and roman numeral yeah. paragraph something yeah. like that you could do um just a scene kid at the uh, thing eating chicken rings it makes a big mess people make fun of her she buries bones in the end. paragraph two family out to dinner and she doesn't want to eat chicken wings anymore. Like, what would right. be the impact? Like, how would that read compared to this? I think that's one way to think about when you see a weird form, like the how to manual. Like, what does it do that the other form would not do? Because it has to add something, it has to change something. Yeah, I think it probably does add and change something. I think, though, my inkling when I see stuff like this is it offers the writer some kind of structure to follow, you know? That helps. Yeah. Yeah. I think who knows what it adds to the story. Story. We could probably argue a lot of things, but I think, I don't know that that's where the argument for the structure was necessarily made. Like if I'm writing this, I'm writing it this way because I'm like, all right, I got three sections. This forces me to keep it tight. This forces me to like focus kind of to like meet a word count. You want to stand out a thousand words. <laughs> yeah, that's what I mean. All stories like this that use a unique form, you only want to do it for so long before people get sick of it. You know, I think a structure like this just, you know, forces you to keep it interesting too. If these are real scenes from her life, and even if they aren't, you have to leave some on the cutting room floor, right? She didn't eat chicken wings three times in her life. So there's tons of other situations that did not merit a vignette or instruction number four or five or six or seven, you know? I have to go find another Kristen Arnett story and read it. Because in my mind, she's, all she does is this how-to manual I'm stuff. fine with I'm, it. I'm fine with it. I'm sure she does it, right? I don't know. Maybe she does. Maybe I'll find another story and it'll be another how-to thing. And that's like all she ever does. It'd be slightly it disappointing because I think she's got a great eye. Like we were talking about the last, the, the eye that we were talking about in the last episode. Right. Hopefully she's writing, she could be writing things other than these instruction things. But uh, I remember reading The Gator Butchering for Beginners and thinking, you know, there's probably like a version of this that I could copy where I could think to myself, I'm going to write instructions, but I'm going to compare it to, you know, something else. But I think this food one specifically is interesting and probably lends itself more to a looser format like the one you're talking about, right? Where you're you're not doing, what did you call it? Like the second person imperative or the, what is it? Yeah, imperative means you're commanding something, like you're telling someone what to do. Like, right. hey, go over there. That's imperative. Whereas like she went over there is in indicative. Yeah. Exactly. So uh, my takeaway from this and what I would probably find myself copying is the idea that you come up with a few examples of your interactions with maybe food or something like that over time, the same food, right? And you can write just a regular story, but it's an interesting premise. And then if you get rid of like the structure of like the three parts, and you get rid of the imperative and you don't title it something like how to eat chicken wings, you know, then we're not so much copying her as we are almost using this as a prompt, right? Because we all have unique 
experiences around food and it changes and it's an interesting way, interesting lens to view whatever that larger metaphor for your life might be. I mean, like, like maybe one of the obvious ones being like, I don't know, like how you've identified with like body issues, right? Like I used to eat and then I starved myself and now I eat again. I mean, there's all these like arcs that you can like come up with like really quickly, but I'm sure there's something a little more unique for each of us that would feel really clever and unique as a short story. I think that maybe my takeaway is just that even if you start with like you want to fulfill a form, it's like the, what I was talking about with the slipperiness, you're not locked into it. You can break out of it. And it's actually, I think some really cool stuff breaks out of form. Like it'll start in one way, but then halfway through it says, I'm just going to do this other thing. Right. Yeah. You know, it, it can wind up being a little meta in that way, but yeah. that's fine if that's where it goes. But I think using it, like you said, this is good for the writer to give you yourself kind of like that impetus or, or structure that helps you get going. Yeah. And then if halfway through you find it's doing something else, like let it do something else. Right. Just follow where the arc, the emotional arc goes. Because that could even be part of the um, the quote metaphor of the piece. Right. It's like breaking form is part of the emotional experience of it. It's like, you know, we're getting out of this. Like I'm gonna we start in a very rigid kind of thing. Now we're gonna break out and be more free form. That could be part of it. Yeah, it offers a structure to the writer, and I think it's just a good um, like I said, exercise. This would be something like, all right, everybody, ice cream. Think of three times you ate it, write a story. I mean, I think that's a solid exercise because when we talk about exercises, the goal is not to turn in whatever slop you came up with on the fly into something. The goal is to be inspired by some aspect of it. And if one of those three vignettes reminds you of a really interesting story or premise or character or voice, whatever, like that's a win. You wouldn't have tapped into that otherwise. So well, the point of an exercise is just practice, right? You're not supposed to come up with something. But if you do, if you discover something, then you you can't just leave it at that. You got to like make sure it is what it is. Make sure that you craft it into the thing that it wants to be. Yeah, you're right. It is just exercise. <laughs> I, I mean, at, you know, at its worst, that's all it is. And then, yeah, at its best, it's like you've come up with something that you want to continue with. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of stories that I try to write and I think they're going to be a story and then they turn out I they're still on my computer. I've written half of a story. Right. It, it turns out it was just an exercise that didn't work. Yeah. You know, I still turn those into the workshop. <laughs> 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 I try not to, but every once in a while. <laughs> I don't like turning in things to the workshop. It's like, I don't know where this is going and I don't know if it's anything, but what do you guys think? Because like you've said a million times before, you know what's wrong with it and they're just going to say that back to you. So it's kind of pointless. Yeah, it is. I know where the weaknesses are and that's what they're going to say. So why bother? Right. Nobody's going to come up with the key because they might have suggestions, but they're not going to be what, they're not you. Right. Unfortunately, it's lonely business. Cool. Well, thanks, guys. If you enjoyed this episode, consider joining our Patreon. Your support helps us keep the show running. Find out more at patreon.com slash why is this good podcast. And for industry news, writing tips, and great short fiction, join our Facebook group at facebook.com slash groups slash Naples Writers Workshop. You can also subscribe to our monthly newsletter at napleswritersworkshop.com.